um, in introduction how glad I am to receive, and I think this is for the first time in this capacity, this is not the first time they've been uh, to a pop activity, but the first time we're having a presentation from leaders from CEMOTAP, the Committee for the Elimination of Media Offensive to African People. Am I close? Very, Very close. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so glad that uh, uh, Brother McIntosh is here, Sister Veronica is here, and Brother John. Brother John is here. Brother John was the MC when I spoke there last week, right? Give them all a big hand for being here tonight. There, there are maybe two or three organizations um, that I personally look at as model organizations for the People's Organization for Progress, and one of those is CEMOTAP. Uh, I've been invited to speak to them on a number of occasions now, maybe, maybe close to four or five times I've been, and we also, as we uh, recognize uh, Brother John, Sister Veronica, and Dr. McIntosh. We also want to give a hand to Sister Betty Dobson, who we are all very familiar with, and uh, who is one of the, the leaders of CEMOTAP. And um, I feel not only a political connection, but a personal connection. When, when I was uh, all broke up, <laughs> when they were trying to put Humpty Dumpty back together in the hospital of uh, Brother Mac and Sister Veronica came to see me and gave me encouragement, yes. you know, and, and helped build my will uh, to live on uh, through that uh, terrible experience. And, and they have rescued me more than once. It's some, I don't even think they know it sometimes. They just keep rescuing the brother and bringing him back. But I'm so glad that Dr. Mack is here. We did this forum uh, in July. It was in July, and I just thought the information that Dr. McIntosh was uh, presenting was so great, and there were so few pop members over there when we had the program. I asked Dr. Mac if he would McIntosh if he would come over and do it here, and uh, he consented, and they're here tonight. So, brothers and sisters, without any further ado, let us welcome in the strongest and most enthusiastic way, Dr. James McIntosh from Semotax. he's going to do a, present, a screen presentation. You won't be able to see it from the back. And, uh, you want me to cut the lights now? or? Uh, yes, you can cut them now. It'll be fine. Okay, so I'm going forward. That's good. Okay. All you have to do is when I say next, just hit that arrow right there. And I'll go forward. Okay, uh, Hotel Brothers and Sisters. Hotel Brothers and Sisters. Power to the people. Power to the people. Black power. Black power. All right, I want to make sure nobody had any problems with any of that. I want to first of all thank God, the great creator of all, uh, for, for you, for your organization, for everybody getting here safely, and, and for allowing me to come and present before this organization. I'm very, very happy to be here. I want to thank uh, your leadership. Uh, you, I mean, I know you all all know you got a great leader here in Brother Larry Ham. Just for persistence and consistency alone, I mean, we have to give our Brother Larry a great uh, big hand. And not to mention the fact that when he's a very inspiring leader, when he gets somewhere, he can take the top off of the building. He's taking the top off of c -Motel. We've had to place two rules because of this brother. And I look in the back and I see my great brother, Brother Zayed. Give him a round of applause. We've been through a few struggles and battles ourselves. And I want to thank my comrades who came over with me today. Uh, there were some points there in the navigation where I was getting ready to go right and they told me to go left. And you see that we got here, so very happy about that. All right, so. Um, my presentation is not the same as it was before, and this is the reason why. 
Um, I'll start it this way. There's a section of the American Psychiatric Association's principle of ethics that says essentially that as a psychiatrist, you know, you can talk about some general topics that have to do with people, but you can't do any type of uh, analysis or breakdown of that person unless, you know, you see that person individually or unless, uh, they, and, and that they also, it's not an unless, and that they also give you a release or, or, or uh, permission to do so. There's no rule of anything, the American Psychiatric Association, the Bible, or anything, that I've been happier to break any more than this one. Next slide. When uh, a few years back I wrote a book called The Unauthorized Psychoanalysis of Rudolf Giuliani. You see, I can't hold those standards with a public figure that does things so directly against me and my people. I'm looking at you, what did I train to be a psychiatrist for if I can't talk about the stuff that you're doing in psychiatric terms? So now, I want you to know I went to good schools, uh, not the least of which was right here in Newark. I went to the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey. Uh, that's where I graduated from. I did residency at Harlem Hospital. I did a fellowship at Einstein, uh, what do you call it, Montefiore of Einstein uh, Medical School. And then when I really want to get nasty with people, like if I'm in court or something, I say of Yeshiva University because that's what <laughs> Okay, so now this book, we broke uh, uh, Giuliani down. Next, please. This first slide I have for you is a video. And it's, it's just a video. I mean, sometimes you just get lucky. My topic today is not the unauthorized psychoanalysis of Rudolf Giuliani, it's the unauthorized psychoanalysis of Donald Trump. And I get to give you uh, a look at both. Before that, I'll tell you a little story. Once Trump was doing a, uh, what do you call it, a deposition. And the attorney on the other side asked for a break to go and pump breast milk. This is a natural, normal thing. This guy freaked out. He called her all kinds of names. His face turned red and he walked out, so on and so forth. Now I wanna, want you to keep that sensitivity to something so natural and normal as a woman feeding her child from her breast, to keep that sensitivity as you watch this video. I hope you can hear some of the sound. Okay, now let me see, let me do this. I'll do this myself, excuse me. That's Donald Trump. Thank you. Maybe, maybe I could show much people. This thing. I like that. This, this may be the best of all. Now, see, he wants to breastfeed from fake breasts. Donald, but a woman. Can't say I didn't try. I'm sorry, I may do that many times just because of the logistics here. I hope you'll forgive me. All right, the next piece is uh, a letter. This is after Trump has uh, become the president and it's signed by two um, prominent mental health professionals. One is Dr. Herman of Harvard Medical School. The other one is Dr. Lifton, a lecturer at, uh, in psychiatry at Columbia. Just the red things to show you. This is an op-ed letter that was sent to the uh, Times. They expressed concerns about his fitness for office, repeated failure to distinguish between reality and fantasy, uh, accusations of other people uh, without proof, and such as that Barack Obama had engaged in partisan surveillance against them and had actually bugged Trump Towers and. They said they felt obliged, despite that um, injunction by the APA to do so, they felt obliged to warn people that, you know, he might endanger us all. That if he's got his uh, hand on the button and he knows the nuclear codes, that he could be a danger to us all. 
even before the election, three psychiatrists wrote to Obama to demand a psychiatric evaluation of Trump. Let me make a, a, a disclaimer here too, a very weak disclaimer, that this is, this stuff is only my opinion about him, and it's just a personal opinion, no matter how professionally it is rendered, okay? Is that, is that exception duly noted? Okay, thank you. So let's go to the next one. All right, now Judith Herman, this book, I always recommend to any of my patients that are victims of trauma. And if you have had uh, trauma, you should read this book. It was on the Times bestseller list at one point. And she and two other doctors, they wrote, and I'll go a little bit into what they said. They said, we are writing to express, this is before he was the president, while he was the president of the letter. And this is a serious letter. They say, we are writing to express our grave concern regarding the mental stability of our president-elect. Professional standards do not permit us to venture a diagnosis for a public figure whom we have not evaluated personally. Nevertheless, his widely reported symptoms of mental instability, including grandiosity, impulsivity, hypersensitivity to slights or criticism, and an apparent inability to distinguish between fantasy and reality, lead us to question the fitness for the immense responsibilities of the office. We strongly rep recommend that in preparation for assuming these responsibilities, he receive a full medical and neuropsychiatric evaluation by an impartial team of investigators. Very, very strong. Now, although I, I, I was going to write a book on trauma myself because of years and years of working at places like I used to work out in the suburbs, a little place called Rikers Island, everybody know that suburb? <laughs> okay. And uh, uh, that was when I was uh, doing a fellowship in public and community psychiatry. And I came to learn things about trauma. I came to learn that most of the prisoners were traumatized. I came to learn that the nomenclature uh, that we use, the, the, the nosology called the DSM, and I've been from DSM-2 to DSM-5, that uh, it's racist by nature. You know, uh, when they talk about uh, there was a point where they would rate the kind of stress you were under. But I noticed that when they went to jail or something, they took for granted that, you, you know, uh, these people, they, they never considered that. Being in prison is a trauma. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying to you? Now, if, if, if a, a rich guy like this guy, Wiener, goes into prison, oh gosh, it's a terrible trauma. But they expect you to just go through that every day and just suck it up. Yes. You know, it reminds me of the joke, and I can't remember whether it was Moms Mabley or Dick Gregory told the joke, about these bank robbers. They were robbing the banks and shooting people and killing people, so eventually they got caught. It's a black guy and a white guy. And then eventually, when they got caught, you know what they're gonna do? They, they were gonna hang them, they were gonna string them up. So as they were there on the gallows, all of a sudden the black guy heard the sniffling. <laughs> he said, man, what's the matter? He said, I don't want to be hung. I don't want to be hung. Brother said, man, why don't you shut up? And, and we done shot up all these people and robbed all these banks. You know, take it like a man. You, we got to be hung. And said, the white guy looked at me and he said, that's easy for y'all to say. Y'all are used to it. <laughs> you see? But that really is the attitude uh, when you're dealing with traumatized people, and I dealt with traumatized people, and I thought I knew some things that other people, that no one else in the world knew. I thought that based on my experiences. And then when I looked in this book, this lady knew a lot of it. The only had one problem with the book. Mm. She invented a new diagnosis, which was like a compound, a complex post-traumatic stress disorder. That's what I was coming across. People that were traumatized. Sometimes you say, why would a person be given a life like this? Traumatized in infancy, in preschool, in elementary school, in junior high school, in the prison system, in the uh, uh, foster care system, you know, and then as an adult. And she described it, that, that, you know, that, this, that this goes beyond just regular trauma. And she said that very often these people would be in an incarcerated position. But when I looked in the index and went through the book, the glaring trauma the trauma of the United States, unless you're going to consider the, the uh, genocide of the indigenous people, the trauma of the United States is obviously chattel slavery. Yeah. You know, it's chattel slavery. It's not even in the book. So I usually will give black patients this book, and probably I should give it to white patients too. I give uh, Post Traumatic Slavery Syndrome by Joy DeGruy Leary with it also. Go to the next one, please. Yes. 
Okay. Now, the first thing, I remember the, one of the first times we went to examine patients, you know, uh, like you're in your second year. You're not quite in the third year yet, but they call you doctor already at UMDNJ. They call you doctor from the second year into the medical school. So you go in there. We went, we saw this patient, all of us trying to be, you know, on top of things. And the attending says, uh, tell me uh, what, what, what you see. They, they broke, broke down. The first part is inspection. The second part is palpation. You touch the patient. Then you uh, auscultate, you listen, and then you, you know, there was a bunch of things, you know, in a row. But inspection is the first thing. Want to know what was the first thing we saw about this patient? People saying, well, looks like his chest is heaving, uh, looks like he's breathing such and such a relationship to his heart, looks like that. So the guy said, no, he's got a tattoo. He's got a tattoo. So, in other words, first thing you do when you see a patient is look. Look to see what's going on, you know, look to see what's happening. That's going to reveal a lot of information. Is the person emaciated? Is the person uh, obese? Is the person sweating? Is the person clean? Is the person wearing appropriate clothes? And so on. So when you look at a person, a lot of times I've just come to the point of like where I know generally when something is psychiatrically wrong, when there's a problem, just when I look at the person. You know, this is after 36 years of practice, okay? So here is a clue. I mean, you could look at this guy and see that something's wrong. Look at this thing. I mean, at one point he had this thing. He was looking like Elvis on estrogen, you know, with a peak of his hair all the way out here. Uh, next slide, please. People have taken pictures when the wind got it, compared it to chickens, all kinds of things. Next slide, please. Okay, here's another odd person. You could look and see something's wrong. Look at this guy. Look at that mustache. Now, I'm not against individual freedom to be different. I'm saying there may not be anything wrong with you, but there certainly is going to be something different about you if you choose to look like this. Next slide. That's not a random slide. So this is Cy Sperling, the inventor of the uh, hair club. And you know he used to say this thing about, I'm not just the president, I'm also uh, the uh, client. OK, uh, I said, if the United States was a mental hospital, Trump could say, I'm not just the president, I'm also a patient. Please spread us. Uh, next slide. These are some people, they do these things to make, you know, next. We can't see Next. the uh, slides. Okay, I'm sorry. All I can do is suggest that you move because I don't have many options here. Okay. All right? I need to stand here so that I can uh, see the slides. Now, in the first, that I've been doing a series. I'm writing my second book. The, uh, that's not my second book, but I'm writing another book, I should say, on the unauthorized psychoanalysis of Donald Trump. And I'm doing the same thing that I did with the unauthorized psychoanalysis of uh, Rudolph Giuliani. I published the first seven chapters in the Amsterdam News in a series, you know, as a serial. Mm -hmm. So the last uh, seven weeks, my unauthorized psychoanalysis of Donald Trump has appeared. And in the first one, what I said was, after I said all kinds of things about Trump, I said, but you know, for me, as a person of African ancestry, I can't just look at Trump and say that he's so unusual. Okay, I can't look at him and say that he's so crazy in the context of the presidents of this empire. Because 18 of them had my people in chattel slavery. Now what's odder than that? What's crazier than that? To take another person and... Next slide. Benjamin Rush is one of the... See, and, 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 see, and the APA, well, I never joined the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, because, you know, when I went through DSM-1, and at the, 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 uh, DSM-2, I should say, and the subsequent ones, that's his picture on the cover. That's Benjamin Rush. Benjamin Rush is one of the so-called founding fathers. He signed the Declaration of Independence. And he said that all black people, he thought the dark skin was curable. And he would use a person that had little patches of white on their skin to prove, like, look, see, this guy, he's, on, you know, he's got a, another 200 years and he'll be white. And he'll be regular and he'll be normal. He thought that we had something that was akin to leprosy. We had a non-contagious form of leprosy. And because of that, we had thick nerve ends. And because of those thick nerve ends, we endured pain more than other people. We could stand pain. We didn't need uh, a relief from pain as much as other people. Next slide. Uh, so this made other clowns like the one on the left. The one on the left is called J. Marion Sims. That's a statue uh, in New York, in a New York park. 
He is called the father of American obstetrics and gynecology. He invented the speculum. He was the master of fixing one particular gynecological problem, which was rectovaginal uh, fistula. Mm -hmm. Joy Leary asked a good question. You know, there was a letter from a guy saying he wanted the, the, the woman fixed. She was saying, well, why was he so worried about this? Or the only thing that would happen is, is that, you know, the person might smell foul, or they could still work in the fields. Why were you so, he was so concerned because our people were put to other uses other than just working in the field. Y'all understand what I'm saying, right? Okay, so that's J. Marion Sims. And because of Benjamin Rush's teaching that we could endure pain more, he did surgeries on black women in their private parts with no anesthesia. And one woman, Lucy, he did surgery over and over and over again. He's hailed as a great hero. All right, this next one over here, I know you've all heard of this guy. This was Dr. Samuel Cartwright. He, he, was, he was famous for the treatment of black people who were sick enough to run away from slavery. He said they suffered from something called draftomania. That's what Trump's saying. You taking a knee in this good country? Just because we shoot you down, you must be un-American. Okay, you got some disease. Switch, please. That's an idealized picture of Lucy um, J. Marion Sims, the and he was the president of the National, uh, pardon me, the um, American Medical Association. So in my first article, you know, I just said, hey, before I'm going to start talking about uh, any kind of crazy presidents, you know, understand that we had a lot of crazy ones of the APA, the AMA, and the United States of America. Yes. So you can go to the next one, please. All right. For example. Uh, George Washington, who has said, I mean, he, he wrote eloquently on like, how can we, you know, deprive a man of his freedom and do such and such. And yet, we see this passage where uh, after a uh, an enslaved African named Charlotte was beaten by this guy, Anthony Whiting, Washington wrote, your treatment of Charlotte was very proper. And if she or any other of the servants will not do their duty by fair means or are, or are impertinent, you know, if she starts taking a knee when we're trying to sing Dixie or whatever. Uh, correction as the all, only alternative must be administered. Okay, so understand this. You can't make someone work from can't see to can't see. Yes. Allow you to take their children into the big house and do whatever you want. Take your wife into, you can't, a person will not do that because of the threat of death. A man would say, kill me, but measures beyond death were employed in the enslavement of our people. Yeah. Torture. Talk about it. All right? You understand? Torture. Talk about it. Torture was routine in slavery. Yes. Next, yes. next. This is a guy who DNA proved him innocent of rape. This is Thomas Jefferson. How, you might say. When I was in college, I read uh, J.A. Rogers, 100 Black uh, Amazing Facts About the Negro, 101 Amazing Facts About the Negro, yeah. and I saw that Thomas Jefferson had an uh, 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 African mistress by the name of Sally Hemings. So I went to my history professor and I said, look, look at this, this says it. And he said, let me see the source. He said, no, that's the liberator. That's a specious source. Those are specious sources. He says, this is, this is not true. There's no truth to it at all. And that pretty much was the position of the average American uh, um, historian. But in 1998, DNA uh, examination proved that the Hemings who were tracing themselves back to Thomas Jefferson indeed were his progeny. You understand what I'm saying? So uh, when they proved that, he, you said, well, how did that prove a medicine of rape? This is how. Go to the next slide. It became love. Yeah. It went from it never happened Till it was love. All right? Next slide. Love. Jefferson in Paris. When she went with Jefferson in Paris, she was 14 years old. She was also, her mother had the same relationship to Jefferson's wife's father as she had to Jefferson, meaning that she was Jefferson's wife's sister. Some would say half sister. Which meant that she was what to Jefferson? She was his sister-in-law. Mm -hmm. Which means that Thomas Jefferson, the man with all the flowery words, 
was an incestuous, pedophilic rapist. Okay? That's just facts. I'm not trying to be nasty. Next slide. Next slide. Love. Love. Next slide. Love. Next slide. Love. Hey, who put this in here? Who put this in here? Must have been my kids. Next, next slide. All right. Now, if the world wanted to prevent the coming of a grandiose, misogynic, racist, wicked president named Donald Trump, you would have had to start a long time ago with his family. First of all, the family started out in Germany. Where else? This is Friedrich Trump. That's what it says on his immigration papers, although it may have simply been a misspelling. And Elizabeth Christ, yep, Christ, like as, as in Jesus, that was the, she was from Bavaria. Where is Bavaria? Germany. So his, his grandmother and his grandfather were German. Now, you know you're going to cause some grandiosity in the family when you name your child, and this is Trump's father, is named Fred Christ Trump, okay? My middle name is Christ. I mean, who can blame you if you think you're special with a middle name like Christ, right? Okay, Mary McLoy, his mother, is from Scotland. No relationship to Mary McLeod Bethune, although it's spelled, the last name is spelled pretty much the same way except with an A. Okay, now, what's the importance of this? Remember the Bertha movement? Mm -hmm. yeah. Trump is a second generation immigrant. His mother was from Scotland. All of his grandparents were born out of the country. Obama shares with him, he's a second generation immigrant, but two of his grandparents were born in the United States. You get it? Gotcha. So he was more American than Trump. I mean, if you're going to do that genealogy thing, he was more American than Trump. Yet Trump went through all this stuff. Now, secondly, I want you to put a pin in this, that it was Elizabeth Christ who started the business. First of all, Friedrich made his money in the Yukon region of Canada. All right? Some people say he operated a brothel. I'll be polite and say he operated a hotel which served food and also had rooms for minors that want, might want to be with a woman who uh, sold sex for money. So some people call that a brothel. I just call it a hotel. But that's who his grandfather was. That's how he made his little seed money. Elizabeth Christ took that money and she got into uh, real estate and her son Fred and her operated a business that dealt with real estate, construction, that sort of thing. And that is what Fred and Donald turned into an empire. Now, there was another Fred Christ Trump who was the son. He might have been the most sane Trump of all. They hated him. You know why? Because he was such a failure that he became an airline pilot. And they would say to him repeatedly, why wouldn't you just stop this fooling around with the airplanes and, and do something to make some money? That's what they were about. They were about money. If you were an airline pilot, something that we would all think if our son or daughter became an airline, wow, they're great success. That was, like, that was like trash to them. As a result of that, and that criticism and stuff, he became an alcoholic. He died young. And so it was Donald who took up the mantle of carrying on the family business. But there were already many things in his family legacy that we can see contributed to his personality. Now, his father had the awful secret. His father tried to go back to Germany, by the way. Uh, not his father. His uh, grandfather tried to go back to Germany. And Elizabeth was pregnant with Fred while she was in Germany. It's just a sheer coincidence that he, that he wasn't German also, that he wasn't born there, but Germany wouldn't take him back. You know why? Because the, the grandfather was uh, a draft dodger. All right? He had dodged World War I, where Hit, that Hitler was in. He, him and Hitler might have been Fox pole mates. Um, uh, and, and so they didn't take him and they sent him back. So that's how he came to be here in the United States. Now, the big secret, though, that he had was that 
in around, I think it was around 1927, he was arrested at a Klan rally. Right. Mm. Next slide. He was one of seven people arrested, and this article said that all of the people arrested, and they gave their names, wore Klan regalia. What does that mean? He was arrested with a hood and a robe on. All right? Next slide. That's the Long Island Press that says that. Next slide. Trump says, my, my daddy was no Klansman. However, the address on Devonshire Road, the census list says the address for Fred Trump and Mary McCloy, Mary McLeod. So what does that mean? That means that Donald Trump's father was in the Ku Klux Klan. Yes. Okay? Now, if he wasn't in the Ku Klux Klan, even if he wasn't, he acted like it. He refused to rent housing fairly to black people, uh, and the government had to force him. And so by consent decree, and this was, Donald was kind of running things at this particular point, at least was a figurehead, Donald had to sign a consent decree in the 70s to, that agreed, and it's like being found guilty without uh, having to admit guilt. Next slide. Wayne Barrett uh, delineated some of the techniques that were used. A person who came to the building, if they were white, they'd be given an application. If they weren't, they'd be sent down to the central office. Mm -hmm. uh, um, next slide, please. Okay. Mrs. Wiggins was a nurse, a black nurse, who tried to get an apartment and was refused. And then the, um, uh, I guess it was the NACP, they sent white folks into the and they got the apartment. What's the impact of racism on people? Next slide, please. I got it. Let's take a look and see. She, this, this elder will tell us what the impact was on her life. I hope you'll be able to hear it. An apartment in the Trump building is based on the color of my skin. Before Donald Trump got into the penthouses and the luxury casinos, he and his family were involved in low and moderate income rental housing in Brooklyn, Queens, and other cities. I applied and was told by the Trump Corporation that there were no vacancies. What they told me wasn't true, and when she complained to the New York Human Rights Commission, they were able to determine that she'd been lied to. They sent the Caucasian couple out, and they were told that there were vacancy. You can't deny discrimination in the same unit that has been denied to a black person is offered to a white person. I feel very, very angry. So much so that it still evokes it still evokes anger, anger and hurt. Deep, deep hurt. The allegations of discrimination against the Trump businesses began when his dad was running the company, but then continued after Donald Trump was named as president. That's when the Justice Department became involved. We found how Trump personnel would be told to deal with people of color. One of the ways in which they were told to deal was to put a big C on their application. And it's frankly just a tiny minority that would engage in activities that would be so blatantly illegal. We sued the Trump Organization and Fred Trump and Donald Trump. Donald and Fred Trump and the company eventually settled the case. The proof was so clear that the Justice Department was able to obtain uh, a strong consent decree. It is functionally the same as being found guilty of discrimination except you don't have to admit discrimination. Once the suit was settled, that wasn't the end of the discriminatory activities, and a couple of years later, the Justice Department had to file a motion against the firm again. 
if he carries this practice over as president, I fear for certain minority groups because I can still hear Trump saying, knock the crap out of him. Knock the crap out of him. What do you seriously? Boy, he knows my African American. No, look at my African American over here. As if he was some pet dog. He is not worthy of becoming president of this country. This is Trump's mentor. He represented Trump in that case. By the way, Trump's resistance to this stuff lasted. It was not settled until 1982. So we have a guy that was resistant, even, high, even letting black people live in his apartments until 1982. This is Roy Cohn, and he was a member of the US Department's Justice Prosecution at the trial of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. How many people remember the poem, Who, by Amiri Baraka? Yeah. Remember when he talked about the good people murdered? He was talking about Julius and uh, Ethel Rosenberg, and one of the people that participated in that lynching was Roy Cohn, a very, very nasty guy. He also uh, was chosen, hey, um, Zaid, by J, 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 he hired Cohn as his chief counsel, choosing him over Robert Kennedy, in part to avoid accusations of anti-Semitic motivation for the investigations. Next, next chart, uh, please. So <clears throat> what is that um, McCarthy hearing? The McCarthy hearing was involved Senator Joe McCarthy and the US Army, and it's the Red Scare uh, period. And McCarthy was a great liar. So was um, uh, Roy Cohn. They were very, very nasty. And Roy Cohn's other, other clients included people like um, Tony Salerno, Carmen Galanti, Steve Robell, and John Gotti. He was an advisor to Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan, was a member of the John Burke Society. He was accused of being an anti-Semitic Jew and a homophobic homosexual who died of AIDS. Go back. Okay, I think this is a... I missed one of the videos, okay. This, I want you to listen for Wayne Barrett's assessment of Roy Cohn, okay? Understanding that that's Donald Trump's mentor. Because if you understand it, you will realize that Trump is acting just like Joe McCarthy. Yes, yes. He's acting just like Joe McCarthy yes. and that Roy Cohn was his chief counsel. Roy Cohn taught him these things. These aren't accidents. And I want you to also listen to Roy Cohn's assessment of Donald Trump. Hmm. From me, good friend, Roy Cohn. Yet the man that everybody is going to enjoy meeting is Roy M. Cohn, who is confidential assistant to the United States Attorney General. In 1953, Roy Cohn became chief counsel to Senator Joe McCarthy's Communist Hunting Investigations Committee whose reign of televised intimidation in the 1950s has become synonymous with demagoguery, fear-mongering, and character assassination. Cohn went on to private practice and made millions. He became one of the most politically connected lawyers in the nation. The last two decades of his career were marred, however, by allegations of fraud, blackmail, and perjury. When I was assigned to New York for Ronald Reagan in 1979, the 1980 election. Shortly thereafter, I was invited to a dinner party uh, being thrown by a Washington socialite uh, who, in all honesty, I was trying to lay. That's Roger president. Stone talking. So Remember that I name. I way up to him. I introduced myself. I said, uh, Mr. Cohen, I'm Roger Stone. He looked at me and he said, are you the son or the grandson of the Roger Stone who's running the Reagan campaign here in New York? I said, no, that, that's me. He turns to his partner, Tom Bowen, and he says, Reagan's in trouble. I wrote a lot about Roy Cohn. I started hearing about Roger from people who were close to Roy. Roy Cohn is the single most evil person I have ever known. If that's a magnet for you as a young man, it says you're soulless before you start. Well, my attitude regarding those who criticize me for being friends with Roy Cohn or Richard Nixon is, 
doctor's relationship with Cohn was an important mentor. Cohn had a slice of history and a circle of friends that would not have necessarily been part of our orbit. It's how we met Trump. Donald Trump is probably one of the most important names in America today. He is, as I say, the closest thing to a genius I've ever met in my life. On a special segment tonight, Mike Jensen profiles a man who, at the age of 39, is not content with being New York City's latest real estate billionaire. Donald Trump has also ventured into gambling and professional football and says he could negotiate a nuclear disarmament treaty with the Soviet Union. Donald Trump. This is when he was 39. Top city. Steve, you're going to have to start pushing these people now a little bit because it's getting a little ridiculous as far as I'm concerned. At the age of 39, Donald Trump has become one of America's best-known and most successful builders. And not surprisingly, he has an ego almost as big as his empire. I had a lawyer who was a very good lawyer, a tough lawyer, named Roy Cohn. He introduced me at one point to Roger Stone. Roy thought Roger was a very tough guy. Roy knew some very tough guys, I will tell you that. But Roy always felt that Roger... Okay. So... What do we want to take away from that? You know uh, Roy Cohn was a nasty person. He was Trump's mentor. You know that Roger Stone and Trump, they go all the way back there. Now, Roger Stone is the person who said that if, if you try to impeach Trump, he has promised there's going to be violence of a level you've never seen in the United States of America. Now, that is something that would be very hard to top if you know how much violence there has been in the United States of America. And Roy Cohn thought a great deal of Donald Trump, didn't he? It stands to reason. This is a picture of um, Trump when he was in military school. These are his siblings, including the Fred, uh, who, uh, the heir apparent who actually uh, died early. Uh, what father says this about his daughter? He says, I don't think my daughter Ivanka, and this should be a parenthesis around that, would play, play, uh, pose for Playboy, although she does have a very nice figure. I've said if Ivanka weren't my daughter, Perhaps I'd be dating her. Okay, now, that reaction that I heard somebody say, my God, was exactly the reaction of the uh, host on The View. When they said that, when he said that, they, you know, the people screamed, hey, who are you, Woody Allen? Put a pin in that. All right, now, right here, you see this is him again. She's, his wife is tw only 12 years older than, uh, than his daughter. I had some other poses. Here's one that they took. Now, the reason I said this, how much is 1994 minus 1981? Because at the time when I made this slide, I hadn't read material at all already showed it to me. Because I looked at it because there was a young woman just before the election by the name, they called her Katie Smith in the press. She's called Jane Doe in court documents that claimed that when she was 13, Trump and a, a, a convicted pedophile by the name of Jeffrey Epstein took her virginity. All right? And I said, well, 13. I said, well, how old was Yvonne? And when I looked and saw that she was exactly that same age, I've since, she was the same age. In other words, this woman is a woman now, but at that time she was 13 years old, which was the exact same age as Ivanka. And she says that Trump told her she reminded him of his daughter. All right. Hitler was also reportedly a pedophile switch. Uh, his uh, uh, niece, Gelly Rabal, he was obsessed with her. He didn't want her to go out with anybody else, so on and so forth. And then in a rage, he apparently killed her. I mean, anybody, you just read, go look it up, read any report, you'll understand that Hitler killed her out of a, in a jealous rage. It almost sunk his political career. It did not. But the point I'm making is, is that there are similarities in the personality of Trump to, uh, to Hitler. Now, it's easy to say that people are like Hitler, but let's go a little further. All right, this is showing you uh, one of the letters that she wrote in which she talked about the disgusting things that Adolf was making her do. Next, next slide. Now, here we go. This is why this is important. This was, how many people remember this? This was a Central Park Boys. These were a bunch of young men who were in the park on a night where a rape occurred. The rape was actually done by a serial rapist who had raped people even the same week that this event happened. 
They did things to stretch the time, you know, to make it fit them, and that's because some certain things didn't click even in the beginning. The press had a field day. They took their pictures. They put them on this on the thing and said they said they were wilding. It showed them laughing and singing as though they were laughing and singing at what had happened to Patricia Mealy, the, the woman who was uh, um, assaulted in the park that night. And Trump spent $85,000 to put ads in all four New York dailies, major dailies, uh, with this stuff and basically is calling for their lynching. Now, Let's, uh, next slide please. Next slide. Next slide. This is, that was just a, that's, this is Epstein. I'm coming back to the Central Park boys, okay? This is Epstein. This just shows you he's a convicted pedophile. Who's he walking with over there? Woody Allen. That's Woody Allen and Woody's uh, daughter, wife, daughter, Chinatown, excuse me. Anybody, nobody saw that movie, apparently. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. All right. Trump, even after these people are, after you've proven that it was something, the police didn't release them from jail when they found out. When the real rapists confessed, they didn't release them from jail. Instead, they put them in the yard with this guy to see did he know them. And he, they didn't. They didn't know him. And ultimately, they still didn't release him, but pressure from the community. December 12th movement and other segments of the community demonstrated outside of Trump Towers, and, and they had to eventually release them. Not only that, they gave them a $40 million settlement. Now, yeah, okay, so that, that kind of says you're innocent if they're going to go that far. Now, Epstein was accused of assaulting a young woman who worked as a towel girl at the Mar-a-Lago Resort. Mar-a-Lago, anybody hear that? Mm -hmm. That's Trump's private resort. That's where, and he was a member In of Florida. that. Okay, now, the young woman, another young woman, not that young woman, okay, another young woman, Katie Johnson, says that Epstein and Trump raped her took her virginity when she was 13 years old. Epstein eventually got convicted of having uh, sexually assaulted 40 young women. A man by the name of Alexander Acosta, the local US attorney, organized a deal where Epstein's punishment was, after being found guilty, was to serve 13 months in jail at night only. In other words, he could go about his life the way he, he just had to sleep in the jail at night, and he had to pay restitution. The restitution to these young women was like under $100,000 a piece. He's a, not a millionaire, he's a billionaire, all right? Trump said very favorable things about him in the 90s. But when this stuff happened, Trump uh, said that he was not friends with Epstein. But check this out. Remember that guy Alexander Acosta, the guy that got that deal from him? Mm -hmm. yeah. Trump appointed him as Secretary of Labor in the, in the cabinet. So my question is, if you did that for a guy who helped somebody that wasn't even your friend, uh, what would you have done differently if he'd helped your friend? You get it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, these are done. This is the man that's wrapping himself in the flag right now. You're kneeling at the national. He's wrapping himself in the flag. Second generation immigrant. We can't see his taxes. That's how patriotic his he is. We can't see his taxes. He's wrapping himself in the flag. Two of his wives are from behind what they used to call the Iron Curtain, the Eastern Bloc. Yes. the Soviet blocks so on and so forth. The first one, here she is holding her, uh, I guess, uh, her, her, either her permanent uh, resident papers or her citizenship papers. That was Ivana Trump. The second one, the second one this is um, Marla Maples. She's from the Confederacy. Why do I say the Confederacy? Because when they were married, 
Georgia, where she's from, still had the Confederate flag symbology. It's one of five states with Confederate flag symbology in its flag. Right. So she's behind the cotton uh, 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 <laughs> cotton curtain and the next wife. Now, when I hear the woman, I keep thinking of that one in um, From Russia With Love. That's what comes to my mind every time I see it. Remember that other thing, Trump wasn't, isn't now just talking about Russia. He was talking about Russia when he was, what, 39 years old. And he kept marrying women. I mean, it'd be like a spy novel. I mean, to me, it's, it reads like a spy novel. And I haven't even gotten to his financial. Now, here's some pictures of some of the so-called Bond ladies, okay, the Bond girls, or whatever they call them, uh, from the Bond movies. And I defy anybody to, to, to separate his wife from any of them. The only way you can separate her is she has on less clothing. Here she is here, that's Trump's wife. Here she is here, that's Melania. Uh, and there's Melania right there. The rest of these are just actresses, but. Okay. Now, she, these are, they were people who were outraged because Michelle Obama showed her bare arms. Yet these are pictures of Trump's wife on his private yacht, handcuffed to a briefcase, and holding a chrome pistol. Something's going on up here in somebody's mind. You understand what I'm saying? Next slide. Larry, am I okay? You good. Okay, all right. Next slide. Now here, this was uh, this woman, uh, Pamela Ramsey. I knew when I saw her, I had seen her before. But she was the... Uh, um, of the West County, West Virginia Development Corporation. West Virginia, that um, bastion of intellectual, uh, okay. She, in a tweet to the mayor, wrote, it'll be refreshing to have a classy, beautiful, dignified first lady back in the White House. I'm tired of seeing an ape in heels. You know who she's talking about, the ape in heels? She's talking about Michelle Obama. Okay, but as I said before, I knew I had seen her before. Oh, uh, no, that's not her right there. Okay, so, oh, you know what? I didn't put it in here. So, what? I, I'm sorry. Um, this is taking it right off the computer. I have a flash drive in which I put an additional slide, and it was uh, this, this lady next to Miss Piggy. <laughs> now, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not body shaming her. I'm simply saying these two people look very much alike if you see them together, and especially since she's calling Michelle an ape in heels. Now, this is on the front page of the, okay, here's this man's words. Grab him by the kitty cats. Remember that? All right? He said, I just start kissing them. I don't even ask. He said, and when you're a star, they'll let you do it. You can, uh, you know, kiss, kiss them. You can grab them by the uh, kitty cat, anything. This is this guy. 24 women have accused him of sexual abuse, inappropriate sexual remarks, and obviously, and two have accused him of all, of, of, of right out a sexual assault. That's uh, Melania when she was in Yugoslavia. That's her father, Victor Nobs, who is a member of the League of Communists, uh, was listed as a member of the League, which was the party that ran uh, Slovenia. Now what's the, the irony of all of this? What would Roy Cohn have done if the current president, when he was president, had a wife who may have been in the League of Communists herself? Because she was an adult when she left Slovenia, and her father was prominent in the, okay, but a woman whose father was in the Communist Party. What would Roy Cohn have said about that? And yet we have this guy attacking people that have been here since before the Mayflower, all right, and calling them uh, un-American. She met Donald, uh, all right. Another question, irony. Okay, I'm, I'm almost finished. Donald Trump has been involved in 1,900 lawsuits. He sues people for, for anything. In fact, when somebody said that Melania was a former call girl, 
they sued, and to the surprise of many people, she won a settlement, okay? So why doesn't he sue Katie Johnson? I mean, wouldn't he want to clear up his routine? You sued 1,900 people. Why wouldn't you sue this show? And this case was open for him till about two days before the election. Yeah. Now, obviously you're innocent until proven guilty, but if you have this record of suing people all the time, why don't you sue Katie Johnson to clear your name? Why did you appoint Alexander Acosta as the Secretary of Labor? The person that helped out Epstein, who you had described as being a great guy. This is just relating this to Hitler. There were the OSS commissioned a few psychiatrists and psychologists to analyze Adolf Hitler before the end of the war. One of them's name was Langer, and another one's name was Murray. And they published a couple of reports. These reports were very uh, helpful in that they predicted that Trump, that uh, Hitler would not give up, that Hitler was going to fight to the end, that he would probably commit suicide. They described that he would commit suicide in a bunk. It went just that far. They had other kinds of things where they talked about him having feminine ways. Uh, other things in which they kind of related a lot of his stuff to rage against his mother, so on and so forth. But some people that analyzed Trump's talk, among other uh, 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 elected officials and stuff, he was rated the highest in terms of feminine language. They said, what is feminine language? It's maybe an inexact science, but I think it's ironic that some of the same words that were used about Hitler, narcissistic, sociopathic, um, feminine, <clears throat> you know, fighting against those things. I think that those, those are, those are, it's significant. It becomes significant. Next slide. I asked who changes personnel like this? This was a helicopter crash. Trump was supposed to be on it. This is when he had the casinos in Atlantic City. He's supposed to be going to Atlantic City. He don't make the, 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 uh, the, the helicopter, but all of the next lines of, uh, of leadership in his organization, they're on the helicopter and they all get killed. Next slide. Wow. Smell, spells mob all the way. That's the way I see it. Next slide. This was when Christian and Giuliani were considered they might be a part of the cabinet, but they all the same type of characters. Giuliani's uh, father was a enforcer. Uh, for a loan shark operation, uh, loan shark operation that operated on Hawthorne uh, Street uh, in Brooklyn, uh, he would actually take a baseball bat and go into Kings County Hospital to collect. Uh, uh, again, Giuliani fits that same model. He was married to his own cousin for over a decade. Yes. Say he didn't know. He got an annulment. Yet they used to play at Grandma's house. Okay, it's it's a little crazy. Same thing, but he has ties to the mob, so does uh, 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 Christie. Next slide. This was because a year before the I told people Trump was going to be the president. It was very clear to me, just by one principle. A guy named H.L. Mencken said, no one has ever gone broke <laughs> underestimating the intelligence of the American people. <laughs> All right? So here you got a billionaire. Can he fix an election? Hey, he's involved in boxing promotion, he's involved in casinos, construction, he changes executives by death, media cover-ups. Yeah, he could do vote tampering and machine tampering, okay? Next, next slide. Almost finished, almost at the end. Skip this one. Okay, here was another factor that went into his election. You notice? Look at, look at Cam Newton. He's mad. What are you mad about? He's mad about this man taking a knee for the fact that if he doesn't have his name on his back when the police stop him, that Cam Newton would get shot down just like every other black man can get shot down. But he's mad because this man is, uh, okay? But this, they're down there where he should be mad about that. There's that Confederate flag again. This brother here, 
Obviously, you know, I mean, you don't, when I see him, I know something's wrong. I don't know what, but I know something's wrong before. Okay, next slide. Okay, it's one she's wearing. Uh, all right, next slide. There's a lot. This is a very, very dangerous. This thing in Charlottesville yeah. is the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Yeah. So this leads into Larry. Uh, we're talking about fighting fascism. You know, uh, it doesn't make an announcement. You just look around, and one day there's more violence. There's more suppression of the yes. of speech. Yes. There's more suppression of the press. Yes. Uh, there's a. Uh, uh, suppression of just your basic ability, the right to, to express your opinion. Those, those um, men are taking a knee and that becomes more important than the fact that it, uh, something that you call a territory of the United States, I don't call it that, but you call it a territory of the United States, which is Puerto Rico, is devastated. People ain't got water. People ain't got uh, electricity. People don't have food. People are sweltering to death in nursing homes uh, with no air conditioning. And you're talking about the daggone NFL. How crazy is that? All right? There are hundreds of these militia groups. This is an executive order signed into action by President Obama, which essentially allows the imposition of martial law. Way back, I was predicting that we will get to that point. We will get to the point of the imposition of martial law. This week at the UN, Mr. Mugabe, I call him Dr. Mugabe because he was like a psychiatrist as he went through Trump. He said he fears that we're getting the return of the great giant gold Goliath. He says, you know, don't talk about annihilate. This is the UN. Don't talk about annihilating other countries. Don't talk about damnation because this will be resisted stiffly. He reminded Trump, we are free now because we destroyed the monster of imperialism. That's his word. He said, bring us another monster and it'll meet the same consequence. He said, Mr. Trump, blow your trumpet. He said, blow your trumpet for unity. Blow your trumpet for peace. Blow your trumpet for dialogue. You know, I mean, it takes Lil Zimbabwe to try to tell this guy yes. how to act presidential. Yes. So, next slide. Wow. Diagnosis, all right. Lots of people have called him narcissistic. Of course, narcissists are grandiose. Narcissists are selfish. The joke about narcissists, uh, the narcissist just keeps talking about himself and then they say to you, okay, enough about me, let's talk about you. What do you think about me? Okay, so he narcissist, but actually I see him in a family of disorders called Cluster B. Cluster B is notable for dramatism and impulsivity. There's four diagnoses listed under that. One is histrionic personality disorder. Certainly he's histrionic, isn't he? He wants to be in every picture, he wants to, okay. Uh, borderline personality, man, does he fit that. If I was to talk about one thing that borderlines do that's so notable, yeah. they, they idealize and they devalue. You're all good or you're all bad. And they do it in rapid succession. So much that they split up groups in the hospital. They have the nurses against the doctors. They have the, he's got, this is how Trump is. He's got the, the kneelers versus the standers. He's got the uh, flag wavers where he's splitting. The country up, this is notable for borderlines. And sociopaths, sociopaths, they have no conscience, all right? He'll say one thing one day, he'll lie the next day. Russia, where is that? I never heard of Russia, right? Okay. His son says that he met with this lawyer from the Soviet Union, whose name starts with a V, in order to talk about adoption. Or what? Adoptions. 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 <laughs> oh, no, he said more than one lie then. What are you saying? <laughs> they said initially that they were talk, going to talk about uh, Russian uh, adoptions. Oh, but what he said, uh, the one I saw, the other lie he said was that they were there to talk about Hillary Clinton. Dirt on Hillary Clinton. Yes, right. yes. But this, this attorney, she said, no, no, no. 
we were there to talk about the repeal of this action that had been taken where they um, uh, have sanctions against uh, certain Russians because of their participation in the murder of a guy who was involved in tax fraud. The bank that was involved in all of that, by the way, was Deutsche Bank. Yeah, Deutsche, Deutsche, Deutsche Bank has yeah. lent Trump or made available to him four billion dollars. That's not M with a uh, 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 not, not a million with an M. That's billion with a B. And we're not even counting two hundred and eighty-five million lent to Kushner's. What's the name? No, I'm saying his name wrong. What's the what's the son-in-law's name? Kushner. Jared. 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 Jared Kushner. Yeah, Jared. lent to the Kushner family. Okay, so there's more coming on this. There's more that you find on this. Some people think that they say, why are you talking about Trump? Why are you talking about Trump? Let me tell you something. It is hard to distinguish between his evil and the other presidents. If I was to go back, you know, some people call Obama, Obama, you know, with a B, B-O-M-B, -B, you know? We go back to George Bush, we go back to, you know, all of these presidents have been some wicked sons of the guns, you know what I mean? Right. They have hurt people all around the world, but, just like Germany has a history, they had a history of aggression and things like that, but Hitler stands out. Sometime personality does play a role in what happens in history. And it appears that this guy is a person who is born right in the right moment. Here's the thing that I don't like. The people who do the analysis of Trump, they keep talking about his flaws, and they go, he's gonna be out of there soon. He's gonna be out of there soon. No, he's not. He has shown you every sign that he is exactly like Hitler. He's going to fight to the end. He won't stop until he has completely destroyed this country. All right? Understand, the reason he's reaching across the aisle now is because he is preparing for the fight. And if you impeach him, because impeachment only means to bring the charges against the person. If you impeach him without putting him out, this narcissist will now, you'll reinforce, yeah, <laughs> I'm Trump, man. He couldn't do anything with me. And he's going to be worse than ever. And he's going to be like an infection that you partially treat. If you get an infection and you take just a little bit of your antibiotics and don't finish taking them, okay, you create what's called a super infection. Because you killed off all the weak bugs now all the bugs that's left are strong, and then they multiply, and now you got something you can't deal with. Yes. These are very, very serious times. This man is, is, is messing with a country that already beat the United States. That's right. The only reason you don't know that another country beat the United States is because, you know, you don't really have freedom of the press. Yes. If I'm six foot three, and I go over to a guy that's five foot two and a hundred pounds, right? And I start to beat him up and he's there duking with me and 30 minutes later, we're still there duking, this guy has whipped my butt. Right, that's right. All right? The United States went and messed with little Korea and Korea fought them to a standstill. All right, they had many battles in which they wiped out units of American troops. Go look it up. So you already got whipped by them by conventional warfare. Don't keep relying on that well, they don't have the way to deliver the bomb. Do, do, do other countries have the way to deliver drugs here? Because if other countries can deliver drugs here, other countries can deliver bombs. In warfare, people always lose when there's something they can't, they can't even envision the way that they can be beaten. You know, when Spain had those big ships and the British invented some little ships that could move faster, even though they were outnumbered, that was called the what? The defeat of the Spanish Armada. Over here, here in Jersey, when uh, one group's uh, soldiers had made a, a formation with three sides around, they didn't need it on the back. Because classical military uh, 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 strategy and tactics tell you, save all your soldiers for the places where they can't come up the Palisades. But what happened? Yeah. Somebody did come up the Palisades <laughs> and won that battle. It's that sort of myopia, which this guy, you know, is very capable of, that puts us in a very dangerous situation right now. You're messing with this guy, Kim, and you can't beat him. If he decided to fight you, all he got to do is get you into a ground war 
All he got to do is get these people here who've been living this cushy life. All he got to have is one bomb smuggled over here and it blows up and now you ain't got your electricity and these people will give up because they don't, they, you know, they will give up. I'm telling you. See? That's why they didn't show you the bodies in the Iraq war. Because they learned from the Vietnam War. They start seeing their sons come back in these boxes. They give it up. So anyway, brothers and sisters, thank you for your attention. That's my psychoanalysis of uh, Don't sit down, brother. Don't sit down. Don't sit down. Okay. Don't sit down. Thank you for question. Give Dr. Mack a big hand. Give him a big hand. We have uh, only a few minutes left to the meeting. And um, there's supposed to be a second part to this. I'm supposed to speak, but I think all the people in this room are very familiar with my views on Trump, that he represents something qualitatively different from the uh, bourgeois uh, selections for president that, that we're used to, that he represents, in fact, an existential threat, not only to the United States, but to the world. There's no doubt in my mind that left unbridled, Donald Trump would not hesitate to use a nuclear weapon against Korea or against Venezuela or against any other uh, enemy. He doesn't, <clears throat> he doesn't care. So rather than me, I'll make a few remarks before we adjourn tonight, but rather than me talking at this point, I'm sure some of you might have a few questions you'd like to ask, and I think you'd find that much more rewarding a few questions to ask Dr. McIntosh, Mike, and Sharon. I saw another hand up here, Nat Williams. Uh, doctor, they yeah. had this course called um, Law and Psychiatry at yes. Rutgers University. Yes. And the um, professor started talking about how, uh, the, well, one of the cases was a Black Panther, and they were trying to them talk about, Black Panthers talk about revolution, they got to be crazy. The second one was, what he called the Puerto Rican syndrome. I don't know if you ever come with that. But Tell me a little uh, more. it says like um, when um, Puerto Ricans or Latin American men find out their wives have been unfaithful, they go crazy. They wind up in the, the now with that, the black student said, Well, is there such a thing as a white syndrome? And once uh, I experienced when um, I worked for the Department of Corrections, Getz was coming down the street and he got in the elevator with me and he was just sweating profusely. Uh, so is there such a thing in the psychology as a, as a Puerto Rican syndrome, the white syndrome, or any other kind of syndrome? Well, this is what I'll tell you. There's a book by a guy named Bobby Wright and it's called White Psychopathic Personality. Well, that's the white syndrome then. I didn't say it, I simply <laughs> referred you to the book. Okay. Uh, so read Bobby Wright, he could explain it a lot more than me. But one of the problems, uh, the biggest problem that white people have is that they have so much power. You see, uh, one, a white man said power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolute. Lord Acton. Yes, he was a white man. Right? Yes, he was. Yeah. Very white. He was Anglo, <laughs> <laughs> British. So uh, the bottom line is, is that they can work children for 14 to 16 hours a day and it's all right. The second they decide to do that, then they look around the world and they say, well, they got those kids working on carpets 12 hours a day. They forget that that's what they used to do. Mm -hmm. All right? They, once they change their mind on a particular issue, they think the, they consider themselves the standard. Yes. They consider themselves to be the policemen of the world. They, see, they think it's all right to interfere in other people's elections. But they don't want no They don't mind in interfering in Chile's elections. They don't mind, but but that you see is a problem. But but uh, that that's not a problem. Them interfering, but other people, somebody doing the same thing to them, uh, is a problem. Uh, they'll have an exam. Uh, I'm trying to think of one of these uh, profiles. Uh, they have a, uh, it's one of these uh, objective tests. All the pictures in it are white, and they're giving that to somebody as a psychological uh, test. They think that, you know what I'm trying to say, it's power. If they didn't have that power, or if you had power, it wouldn't be a problem. The problem is that they have that power. They have an enormous power. They can't see it, 
But that's not the problem that they can't see it. You can see it. If you had power, you can make them see it. Right. You see what I'm saying? So they can go, they go around labeling people. Uh, they, they, I mean, they used to measure people's brains and say this brain. They measure, they think like you can measure intelligence. Yes. Which is crazy in and of itself. But when they found out that the Japanese were scoring high on it, and you, you see them stop talking about it. They don't want to talk about that anymore. You see, now they're saying, well, to get into college and stuff, you need to be more well-rounded. You need to be in clubs and all that sort of stuff. You see? Uh, the only problem is they have the power to do those things. Sharon. Um, yeah, it was very good. Thank you, sir. Uh, very interesting. Um, why do you think um, all of a sudden Trump is... Um, um, going against the uh, the NFL and uh, also to um, not focusing on Puerto Rico. Um, what's going on in Puerto Rico now? You know, with the hurricane. I mean, it's I don't like, think he even thought it out. I mean, I think that, see, that's why it's so easy. When you do something naturally, did you ever see a football player? Yes, he's trained, he's done this, but there's some football players, they'll be running and they see an obstacle and they don't even think about it, they just jump over that obstacle. They're like a natural, they're a natural athlete. Okay, this guy is like a natural dictator. He's a natural, you know, he's a natural, you know, he's not playing one bit. So he probably, given the kind of life, he, he probably didn't even think, he probably didn't even know Puerto Rico was a part of the United States. He think of Florida because it's a part of the United States. You know, the U.S. Virgin Islands, this guy, understand, is not the brightest bulb on the Christmas tree in terms of information and knowledge. But don't play him, don't play him short like that he, can't, that he can't beat people and hurt people. But he thought that Frederick Douglass was, was still alive. The person was talking about Frederick, he said, yeah, we'll have to arrange a meeting and we'll, we'll meet. He, he, he talked to a black reporter, and because she asked him about the, the Congressional Black Caucus, he said, well, set up a meeting, set up a meeting. She said, I'm just a reporter. You know, he thinks like this. So, so what I'm talking so about, the NFL is what? The NFL is a smoke screen and a diversion. He hears Mueller's footsteps coming behind him. I mean, why aren't people on him every day? Show us your taxes. You lied. The meeting wasn't about Hillary Clinton. The lawyer says that it was about uh, uh, sanctions. You lied. Why uh, is your guy making deals with Russia during the inaugural period? You know, this, this stuff is, uh, you know, nobody's, they're not, people are not on him enough. And he's able to just use smoke and mirrors on you. He got everybody talking about the NFL. I'm not talking about nothing but him. All right. Okay. <laughs> Nat. Nat. I think your, your, your election was excellent. Thank you, things that got me. The media. You brought out the media. We know the American people know less than anybody here. When you say we lost two wars, Vietnam, Korea, we know. I know. The Koreans were some bad people. They were fighting people. They were good people. During their court, they used to catch our prisoners over there. The black prisoners, they used to look out for the black prisoners because they knew what we was going through in this country. Yes, no, I tell you, you should keep putting the rockets up. In America, we, we don't know anything that's going on as far as war is concerned. And this man is evil. Like you say, he's completely evil. That's all. And I, I like to take the mess up. Uh, uh, you, you're saying some things that are true, and I saw some faces that kind of frowned. And what I want to tell you is, is that obviously it's not universally true that every uh, black was shown favoritism by Korea or Korean soldiers nor Vietnamese soldiers. There's plenty of black people got killed by Vietnamese soldiers, plenty got killed by Korean soldiers. However, I was in Vietnam. Yes, they kicked our butts, okay? But some of my friends that were off of the base just before the Tet Offensive, VC told them to go back to the base. I'm sure that, that, that mercy wasn't extended yes. universally, yes. but I can tell you that that happened with people that I knew. Yes. Okay, that happened with people I knew. And that the positions of those uh, socialist governments is that they recognize 
that we are an oppressed people within a government. But you can't show the black American too much because he's over there fighting and killing more than anybody else. There are situations in which the indigenous Americans cut Africans a, 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 some slack. But how much slack can you give them when they're over there killing you? You see what I'm saying? So, yes, the United States lost uh, at least those two wars. In Vietnam, they beat the United States. That's as, it's as simple as that. They, they, when the war started, I mean, I, I, you all don't know all this stuff. I mean, you know that Ho Chi Minh tried to get the United States yes. to help him before he tried to get anybody else yes. to help him. Yes. Right. He tried to get President Wilson to help him. He tried to go to the League of Nations. Yep. He was with a group called the Viet Minh who were fighting, that's M-I-N-H, and they were fighting uh, um, uh, the French. All right, and then they defeated the French at Dien Bien Phu, and then, uh, you know, Kennedy and these people took up, and you had two governments, the South, the North, and uh, they wanted a unified country, and they had it. It's almost inevitable that Korea is going to be reunite, reunified also. They're not going to just keep staying in two countries. I mean, some people might not like it, but they're not going to stay in North Korea and a South Korea. They're the same people. Yeah. There's people with relatives on either side. These uh, geopolitical games that are played by various powers, uh, in the long span of history, they can't, they can't last. Thank you. Sorry Thank, you. Thank you, Dr. McIntosh. Let's give him a big hand. I will take more questions, but you know the church wants us out of here by 9.30, and there's a little bit of business. I thought Dr. McIntosh's presentation was great, don't you? And, and in that regard, Simultap has been so supportive of the People's Organization for Progress over the years. I, I would like us to reciprocate and show that support. Uh, I'm going to go outside of my regular parameters, but I, let's see if I can get some support for this. I entertain a motion that we make a donation of $200 to Simultap for Dr. Mack's presentation. It's moved by Zaid. Is there a second? Is seconded by Ingrid. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing no discussion on the motion, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, all abstain, motion carried. Thank you, brothers and sisters. However, we cannot accept. We want uh, for uh, Pop to keep that money to do the things that you oh, have to do. Man. We're in good shape uh, at CMO Tap. And, uh, but I do, we appreciate the sentiment, and it will be carried back to our executive committee. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Give Dr. McIntosh and Simotep a big hand. Give him a big hand. With regard to fighting Trump and fascism, let me just say what we have on the agenda. For October 28th, we have a march against Trump that will start at the Lincoln Monument at 12 o'clock noon on Saturday, October 28th, which is 30 days from today. So we got some work to do to turn people out and as much harm as he is doing uh, to the black community and other communities of color, we need to have a massive turnout. If we are to defeat fascism in this country, one of the places we must defeat it is in the streets. We must mobilize people in large numbers to not only oppose Trump as an individual, but Trumpism as an ideology and the ultra right wing neo-fascist movement in this country. When I say neo-fascist, I mean almost like fascists. They are not quite there yet, but we see all the hallmarks of a fascist movement in this country. We do not have an explicitly fascist party like a Nazi, well we have Nazis and Nazi parties, but we don't have that party in power yet. But there are people who are working to make that happen in terms of mass movement and mass participation. It seems that the right wing at this point, the ultra right wing, has chosen the Republican Party as their vehicle. They have consolidated the ultra-right within the Republican Party, and Trump essentially used that strategy to come to power. 
Remember, there were 17 Republican candidates, 17 of them. His strategy never was to win over the majority of Republicans. His strategy was to get a large enough plurality to beat the rest of them. In other words, you got 17 candidates. You got to divide that Republican pie up 17 ways. I don't need 50% to beat them. I just need the biggest slice possible. And he got 35%. And he took that 35% all the way to the White House. The other thing we must understand is that Trump is not simply in the White House of his own volition. Yes. Trump is a product of a system that produced him. And if there are not structural reforms to that system, I believe that we will have other Trumps. They will impeach this Trump. Pence will take his place. They will probably, if Trump is impeached and weakened to that degree, his movement will be weakened. And there's a possibility that he might or they might be defeated in 2020. But remember, Trump did not come to power on the majority of votes. That's right. He did not receive the majority. He is a minority president. He is a minority president. Hillary Clinton, for whom I am not a cheerleader, I'm making a statement of fact here, Hillary Clinton received three million more votes than Trump. Now you go all through life and they tell you that democracy is majority rule. You elect the class president, majority rule. You elect the senior class president, majority rule. The student government president, majority rule. The councilman, the mayor, the state legislator, the state senator, the U.S. senator, all majority rule. But when you get to the president, you have something, a relic of the era of slavery called the Electoral College. And they use this Electoral College to, in fact, bring Trump to power. And if the Electoral College is not eliminated, there will be another Trump. We must demand the elimination of the Electoral College and direct election of the President of the United States in this country. If we had direct elections, just like all the other industrial, oh, no other industrial countries have no elect nothing called an Electoral College. That was something put into place because the founders who are glorified as some type of champions of democracy were in fact themselves afraid of democracy. They feared democracy. See, in the beginning in this country, even white people, the majority of white people couldn't vote. In the beginning, when the Republic, when they defeated the British and passed the Constitution, only white men that owned property could vote. They were the only white people that could vote. If you didn't own property, you couldn't vote. Those so-called founding slave masters feared the masses. And they put all kinds of mechanisms in place to, on the one hand, give the illusion of democracy, but in fact, establishing essentially a dictatorship of the ruling class. That ruling class was the planter class at the founding of this country. It was the planter class. The first, I think, seven presidents were all slave masters that had plantations. Washington had six plantations. Had over 300 slaves. They set up a dictatorship of their class. Of course, other people could vote and so on and so forth, but they had mechanisms in place that their rule would be ensured. One of those mechanisms was the Electoral College. The other mechanism was the U.S. Senate. The U.S. Senate initially was not popularly elected. It was elected by state legislatures. And here's the thing. It wasn't put together. Elections of the Senate weren't based on population size, as were elections of the House of Representatives. It was, in fact, two senators per state. But what did that do? 
it put the southern colonies, which had fewer white people and fewer property holding white people, at a profound disadvantage because they had fewer people than fewer white people owning property than those in the north. So what did they do? They said each state will have two. So Rhode Island, who doesn't have as many people as New Jersey, gets two senators. California has like, I think, a sixth of the population of the United States. They get two senators. So in essence, what's coming in America is in fact clear minority rule. Whereas a majority of people in a majority of states who have less population than the people in the other states will in fact be calling the shots. I say America is moving toward a neo-apartheid state. What do I mean by neo-apartheid? Well, we had apartheid. We were the first apartheid state. South Africa didn't have apartheid before the 20th century. That is a 20th century invention that they, in fact, learned from the United States of America. They lifted the laws of racial segregation from our law books to their law books. The system of Bantu stands established in South Africa was based on the system of Native American reservations in this country. And the genocide that they heaped on peoples, uh, especially the Jewish peoples in Germany, they had already practiced on African people in Namibia. Right now, Namibia is suing Germany for reparations for the genocide that the Germans were involved in when Germany was the colonial master of Namibia. So what we're headed toward is a situation where this country will be majority people of color if it is not already. I have a suspicion it already is, but they just don't want the numbers out. So they're telling you 2035, 20, you know, but just like with the colonial situation, they're putting into place a system that will let a white minority control not just the economy, like they do in colonial or former colonial countries, but in fact, they will control the politics as well, even though they are a numerical minority. This country is not a democracy. It is an oligopoly. Oligopoly means ruled by a few, and it is on the way to being a monopoly, not just in economic terms, but also in political terms. Because the, Repu the Republican and Democratic parties, even though they have differences, and even though they compete with one another for power, they are in fact becoming more and more similar. I mean, look at this last military budget. Why were there only seven Democratic votes? And I don't think all seven were Democrats. Why were there only seven Congress people voting against the largest increase in the military budget? Every Democrat should have voted against Trump's military budget, but they didn't. Because more than not, we have situations where some within the Democratic Party, particularly the corporate elite wing of the Democratic Party, see more similarities between themselves and Republicans than they do with us. So we have to build, brothers and sisters, a movement in the street. Trump has got to go by resignation, by impeachment, by electoral defeats, or any other means that God so chooses. And by the way, I call him President Damien. I don't know if you remember Damien from the Omen. I call him President Damien. You know, he's just like Damien. You know, and if you know the story of Kushner, you know that that big building that Kushner can't sell on Park Avenue, its address is 666. Now, I'm not a metaphysician. I'm not a metaphysician. But I'll leave it to you to decide as to what the import of 666 is. But we have to form a united front. A united front. I'm going to say this, and I know people going to get mad because we don't have time to debate it. We need a united front to keep the Republicans out of power. We have a gubernatorial election coming up, a Republican victory. The only two states got gubernatorial elections coming up, New Jersey and Virginia. They're the only two. And Republican victories in either of those 
will give more impetus to this right wing uh, juggernaut that is seized power. We've had a coup in this country. We've had a slow motion coup. Not just right wing elements, but the most extreme elements have seized control of all three branches of government. The legislative branch, with Trump's victory in the White House, the judicial branch, and with Trump's in White House, the executive branch. And now they're moving to seize control of all the state legislatures. And if they can get control of 34 state legislatures, they can call a constitutional convention. They could literally rewrite the constitutional foundation of the country if they control two-thirds of the state legislatures. And I believe that number is 34. They got, I think now, 31 or 32 of the 34. It's a dangerous situation. And people have underestimated, unfortunately, this is my humble opinion, this is not from on high, but it's my humble opinion that people call this situation all way wrong. You know, all ways wrong. But suffice it to say, we need to mobilize as hard as we can to get people out to march on the 28th, but not just to march, we need to vote in November. If we tell people not to vote, we are betraying the very people we say we represent. We are betraying them. We are disarming them. We are taking away one of many weapons. Voting is not the only weapon. We all know that, but it is a weapon. And it's a weapon that Trump used to come to power, and we should use it to take him and his reactionary kleptocratic clique out of office and keep them out of office. So we have to go. But listen, next week is the memorial for Doug. Now, have, have the committee met? Has the committee met and decided? You've been talking? Well, what, what's the committee? Well, let, we don't have time to work this out. The committee need to get together, put together a program. We need to have the program in print before next Thursday because this is the only thing for Doug. Doug's family did not have a funeral for him. They asked because they knew that Doug was so devoted to P.O.P. that P.O.P. hold his memorial service. We cannot do him a disservice in this regard. We have to have something that's strong, that shows love, but shows strength, and is politically progressive, and infused with the principles that Doug stood for in this organization. So we need you to have that work done. Now, on Sunday, in South Orange, there's going to be, all over the country, Sunday, are going to be these marches for racial justice. Have y'all been following this on Facebook? In Washington, in cities all over the country, people are going to be marching for racial justice. I have to speak at the march in Trenton for racial justice, and I have to speak at the march in South Orange. Steve, BJ, y'all having something in South Orange, right? March for racial justice. Maplewood. Maplewood. What, what time is it? Two to four? Huh? It's, it's South Orange Maplewood. It's Soma. They got a group called Soma, right? That's the name of the group? What's it? Huh? Soma Justice. They call me. They ask me to speak. I'm going to go to the one in Trenton and speak there, and I'm going to try to get back in time to speak at the one in South Orange Maplewood. But I am recommending that POP as an organization go to the Racial Justice March in South Orange Maplewood. Where? Uh, it's 2 o'clock. Where are they going to start? All right, I'll send it out to you. But it starts at 2 o'clock. It's going to start, I think, in South Orange. And it's going to be a march. And um, what was the question? And I'll send out the details. I already sent it out to folks on Facebook. But I'll try to get it out to the rest of you that are not on Facebook 
uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow is Friday. But I, I, I huh? We'll go to the march and meet. Just meet there. Let's not make it complicated. Wherever they're meeting, we'll be there with them. But do people think that's good that we should support them in South Orange? Is there a motion that we support the march in South Orange? It's moved by Vice Chairman Adams. It's seconded by Susan that we support the march for racial justice in South Orange, Maplewood. Is there any discussion on the program? All in favor, say aye. aye. All opposed. All abstain. Motion carried. Lastly, brothers from Kenya have reached out to me. I don't know if all of you know, but they have a very contentious election going on in Kenya right now. It's full of, of irony and paradoxes. In Kenya, the son of Jomo Kenyatta is currently the president, and he ran an election against the son of Odinga Odinga, 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 who was the prime minister under Jomo Kenyatta. Initially, they said Kenyatta won the election, but the Supreme Court of Kenya ruled that the election was, was wrong and that it has to be done over. And uh, there are going to be folks who are supporting Ryla, Riley, how do you say his name? Ryla? Ryla Odinga? They're having a demonstration at the United Nations on Saturday. They asked for Pop to come out and support. I told them we have our Popcorn Kids program. Uh, huh? Oh, yes. Adrian Markowitz is uh, waiting. Adrian Walker was his memorial service. Well, anyway, I told him we had stuff to do, but that I would try to maybe get one or two. Is anybody in here interested in going to that uh, demonstration with the Kenyans at the UN? And that's in support of which Riley, Riley Odinga. The one that really won. The one who really won. won. Um, Right. Is anybody interested in going? Anybody can go? <laughs> Two o'clock. At the UN? At the UN. Dave, I'll send out the information uh, to you uh, on it. Are there any other announcements people want to make? Saturday from 3 to 5, voter registration. I'm so happy about our street team. Give our street team a big hand. They have done 40 consecutive Saturdays of voter registration this year. Give them a big hand. Give them a big hand. If there are no other announcements, power to the people.